Hello, I hope you are having a great day. Thank you so much for tuning in. Today we are going to explore early industry and inventions and it's taken from chapter 11, section one. So looking at chapter 11 as a whole, our essential question is what forces and events affected national unity and growth? Why it matters now? The industrial revolution helped create the consumer society that we live in today. So Americans in the early 19th century were surrounded by signs of progress. Economic growth, new machines and factories, and better transportation created confidence and boosted national pride. At the same time, dangerous forces were at work that threatened national unity. So before we learn that the nation gained confidence and worldwide respect as a result of the War of 1812, and today we are going to see that new industries and inventions changed the way people lived and worked in the early 1800s. So at the end of this video lecture, you should be able to identify factors that led to the Industrial Revolution and explain the spread of new manufacturing methods. Uh, also, you should be able to describe new innovations, inventions that changed tra transportation, communication, and agriculture. Here is the vocabulary. Please pause the video and you can write these terms down and then start it again. So our key question, how did the Industrial Revolution change the way Americans lived and worked? So for centuries, people made clothing, furniture, and other goods at home. They did not uh, you know, just go to the store like we do today you know, and buy what we want, but a lot of these materials uh, were made at home. In the late 18th century, uh, in Britain, fac factory machines started replacing hand tools. Uh, by doing this, large-scale manufacturing was producing huge quantities of goods, and these changes are called the Industrial Revolution. So factories rise in New England. Uh, the Industrial Revolution came to the United States in 1793 when Englishman Samuel Slater built the first spinning mill in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. Now, it was illegal for British textile uh, workers to leave the country because Britain did not want their ideas uh, getting out you know, to other countries. But Slater didn't listen. He came to the U.S. and he replicated it. So at first, Slater hired a small group of children and paid them low wages. He later built larger, uh, a larger mill and employed whole families. So this idea of hiring families to work in the mills spread in the New England states. New England was a great place to build factories due to the fast moving water for the mills, as well as access to the ocean for ships to transport the goods. So the region had farmers willing to work in a factory since they were sick and tired of trying to farm rocky soil. So it was a great place to start this industrial revolution in the New England states. So the factory system brought many workers and machines together under one roof. People left the family farming and crowded the cities to work, you know, to get work, and it was located in the cities. Their lives completely changed revolving around this set schedule. You know, this whistle telling them, okay, we're having breakfast, okay, we're having lunch, you're back to work, now you can go home, you're having supper, you're going home. And their life, you know, completely changed from living on the farm, making their own products, their own goods and everything, to now, you know, by the schedule, this is what we do, a lot of people coming together under one roof. So it's a change of life. Now remember during the War of 1812, we had a blockade, and so Americans were forced to produce their own goods. Investors then, uh, since they could not invest in like the shipping and trade, since we weren't doing that, they invested their money into the factories instead. And these entrepreneurs in New England became very wealthy. So let's take a look at Francis Cabot Lowell and how he works his factory system. So we'll start up top. He built a factory that spun raw cotton into yarn and then wove this yarn into cloth on these powerful looms. And he figured out how to make them based on the English mills. So this system was successful and many mills were built and they were known as the Lowell Mills after him. 
Many farm girls worked at these mills and lived in company-owned boarding houses. So just think about how life completely changed from growing up on the farm to now you move away from your family and you're actually living at work. So in the first years, the girls uh, earned very good wages, but then when the profits went down, their wages dropped as well, as well as the working conditions were very poor. And at first, the factories ran on water power, but then after the 1830s, they ran on steam engines. So this allowed for factories to be built away from uh, the rivers and therefore, you know, away from New England as well. So the factories in this system spread. So before items such as guns, uh, we'll, we'll uh, look at how guns were made in this example here. Each gun was individually made, okay? Uh, if a piece broke, then they would have to make a custom piece specific for that gun. Well, Eli Whitney has this idea, uh, and he wants a way to create guns, you know, in a better way. So he has this idea of interchangeable parts, and we're going to make everything the same. So if one part breaks, oh, here's another one. We don't have to custom fit it to your gun since every single one is exactly the same. So machines produced identical parts, uh, and by doing this, it spread up production, made repairs easy, and it allowed uh, the use for less skilled workers because before, you know, you may have had a gunsmith do it, you know, just right. But now if you have these interchangeable parts made at a factory, you know, you can have someone who's less skilled, you know, be able uh, to produce that part. So you can pause the video and make sure that you can answer a key question. Moving on, new inventions improve life. And I am I question this, and you'll see in a little bit, you know, my question is improved whose life? Uh, and did it really improve life? And we're going to talk about that in class, so I can't wait to delve into this, you know, more uh, during class. But the key question, how did new inventions improve American life? So first we'll look at transportation and communication inventions. We have the steamboat, and this was developed by Robert Fulton in 1807, and it could move against the, a current or a strong wind. But uh, there were some faults with it because it was not able to move against the Mississippi River. Well, in 1811, we have the steamship, and this was developed by Henry Miller uh, Shreve, a trader on the Mississippi, and it could move against the current of Mississippi. So I love how, like, I love learning about different inventions and how, like, people take an idea and they perfect it and they make something new, you know, and how, like, the progress of inventions. I think it's very interesting. So you see, you know, you start with the steamboat and then we have the steamship and that gives the idea then, you know, for steam, a train, the locomotive, we have uh, that the locomotive was first developed by English engineer uh, Richard Trevithick around 1803. And in 1830, Peter Cooper built America's first success successful steam-powered locomotive that was called Tom Thumb. And then around 1837, we have Samuel F.B. Morris uh, developed his telegraph, and it sent pulses of electricity through the wire, and the pulses would be translated into letters uh, spelling out messages. So we have Morris code, which is pretty cool, too. It still amazes me, you know, how that works and how they're able to figure it out. I just, ugh, I love this time period. So let's look at technology and how that also improved farming. A light white plow with a steel cutting edge was invented by John Deere. It allowed easier farming in the Midwest. Therefore, more farmers moved there. Before they used cast iron and uh, the, uh, the ground would just stick you know, to the plow and just make it, you know, very hard to do. But John Deere developed this easier way, so you have more farmers, you know, willing to farm in the Midwest. We also have the threshing machine. It was developed by Andrew uh, Mikeley of Scotland around 1786, and it separated kernels of wheat from their husks. Mechanical Reaper was created by Cyrus McCormick in 1831, and it cut grain quickly and effectively. So we have all these uh, different technologies available with farming. So uh, new technologies linked regions and contributed to a feeling of national unity. Uh, for example, uh, with the help of new farm equipment, Midwestern farmers grew food to feed 
the Northeastern factory workers. So see how they're linked now with the Midwest and the New England factory workers. They are feeding the factory workers. So the Midwest farmers became a market for Northeastern manufactured goods. So they are trading with each other. They're also connected with the South because the growth of Northeast textile mills increased the demand for Southern cotton. Okay, so just see how, you know, everyone's working together. It's building this national unity. Uh, the thing I want to point out, though, when the North needs uh, the Southern cotton, it unfortunately expands slavery. And so I go back to the question, you know, how did this improve life? And I ask for who, you know, Americans' lives. It definitely did not enhance the lives of slaves, you know, during this time. So our key question, how did new inventions improve American life? And you can pause the video and see if you can answer that. And then my question was, did it improve life? Uh, and and who specifically, you know, whose lives you know, did it improve? So reviewing our objectives, make sure that you can do these. You can pause the video and look them over. And that's everything. I can't wait to see you in class and to, you know, dig deeper into this, uh, you know, and find out and learn about inventions of that time. All right. Have a great day.